Hello, and welcome to the scientists.com webinar series, the three R's of animals in research. This is part three, refinement, and it's presented in collaboration with the NC3Rs and Sinclair Research. Uh, today, we're gonna have a brief introduction. We're gonna go over a refinement overview with Dr. Sam Jackson from the NC3Rs. Then we're going to talk about refinement in practice with Alex Wakefield of Sinclair Research, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions and answers at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A sec uh, section, and we will go ahead and answer those at the end. My name is Megan Loy. I'm with scientist.com, and I'm the category director of in vivo services. I cover everything from DMPK to toxicology into pharmacology, basically anything that involves live animals. And my job is to help with animal welfare uh, compliance and approvals and help our clients really uh, expand in these areas. Scientist.com is a B2B marketplace and we've been around since 2007. We're headquartered down in the San Diego area in the US, but we also have offices in Boston, in the UK, and in Tokyo. I'd like to highlight our CPHI Pharma Award here at the bottom, and that's for our regulatory procedures and compliance, and that's our comply suite, which is really critical in the animal welfare space. As I mentioned, we're an online marketplace and we do R&D outsourcing. So that means we connect large or small research organizations, basically anyone of any size, with a global list of suppliers that provide those custom R&D services. And we do these in quite a few different areas, but you can see some examples below that relate to animal welfare, in tox, pharma, DMPK, and non-human biospecimens. So animal research is really critical and it's essential to pharmaceutical development. And because of that, we take our obligations really seriously. It's morally and ethically uh, correct to conduct this research thoughtfully. And also we want to support efforts that replace animals, reduce their numbers and refine these procedures wherever it's possible. So to support those efforts, we do a couple of different things. Uh, the first is supplier due diligence. Uh, we also do animal welfare information gathering and compilation for our clients and suppliers alike, and we conduct educational programs such as this webinar. So this is a three-part series, as I mentioned, and this is the last one, Refinement with Sinclair Research. If you're interested in hearing replacement with mim mimetis or reduction with Hera Biolabs, please let us know and we can get you a recording. So next I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Sam Jackson of the NC3Rs. Sam manages a program of work that examines the potential to replace, refine, or reduce animals used to model diseases, measure efficacy, and examine the safety of new drugs. And that includes the application of new technology and human tissue or cells to replace animal models, improve productivity in humans, and benefit disease research and drug development. Dr. Jackson has recently organized several workshops and surveys to explore how human tissue is used in cancer research and safety pharmacology, as well as identify the barriers to increase use of this resource. Prior to joining the NC3Rs, Dr. Jackson spent some time at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he gained over 10 years of experience in research through his postdoc posts in neurobiology and academic and industry settings. So we're really lucky to have Sam join us today, and I'd like to hand it over to him for the next portion of the presentation. Great, thank you very much, Megan. Um, so my name is Sam Jackson. I work for the National Center for the Replacement, Refinement and Reduction of Animals in Research. We're based in the UK. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about uh, the NC3Rs as an organization and a very brief introduction to the three Rs and a little uh, introduction to refinement in terms of showing you some examples of what that can look like. So following on from a government uh, consultation in the UK in 2002, recommendations were made to give greater priority to the development of non-animal methods and the three R's generally, and to set up a national center for the three R's. So uh, the NC three R's was established by government to lead the three R's agenda in uh, 2004. Um, and we uh, lead the three R's agenda in the UK, but our reach really stretches worldwide. Um, we're a leading, now a leading authority on the three R's. We applied the three R's as a framework to support science and innovation um, and to improve animal welfare through investing in people and practice through our grant funding programs um, and driving commercialization of three R's relevant technologies through open, our open innovation scheme, which is called Crack It. We work across the bioscience sector with academics and industry involved in biomedical research uh, using animals and alternative methods. We also work with a wide range of stakeholder organizations outside of the biosciences, including chemicals, organizations, agrochemicals, personal care products, companies, anyone using animals in their research. 
we receive around 10 million pounds a year um, and this uh, is spent on our research funding schemes for uh, mostly for academics to support our open innovation platform crack it uh, and to carry out uh, in-house activities around specific subject areas which we identify um, for instance uh, approaches to that often take uh, the form of a working group or a data sharing approach we have around 30 staff based in our London office and five regional posts um, around the UK, as you can see on the map. So as I mentioned, the NC3Rs, we use the 3Rs as a framework for biomedical science. Um, the 3Rs are important for multiple reasons. Firstly, they provide an ethical framework within which to critically assess animal use. Um, the 3Rs are also enshrined in legislation. So in the UK, that's the Animal Scientific Procedures Act. Uh, and similar legislation uh, is, is, exists in the EU and in the US. There is public support for the three R's. In fact, in the UK, uh, we have an annual poll called Public Attitudes to Animal Research. Um, and this consistently shows that the public support animal use uh, in research only when the principles of the three R's are adhered to. So then trying to replace or refine animal tests wherever possible. Um, and finally, the three R's can be implemented to improve scientific practices uh, and to build new businesses. And I've got an example of, of that on one of my last slide. So really today we're talking about refinement, uh, which can be defined as methods which minimise animal suffering uh, and improve welfare. Um, at the NC3Rs we think of this as advancing research into animal welfare by exploiting the latest in vivo technologies and by improving understanding of the impact of welfare on scientific outcomes of a study. So I just wanted to run through some examples of refinement. Um, refinement refers to methods which minimise the pain, suffering, distress or lasting harm that may be experienced by research animals um, and which improve their welfare. Refinement applies to all aspects of animal use from their housing and husbandry through to the scientific procedures which are performed upon them. Um, some examples of refinement include ensuring that animals are provided with housing that allows the expression of species-specific species behaviours using appropriate anaesthesia and analgesia to uh, minimise and, and manage pain, um, and training animals to cooperate with procedures to minimise the stress. It, it also involves thinking about defining early endpoints prior to a, an animal becoming moribund or dead, um, things like home cage monitoring, which I will touch on a little bit later, and um, improving welfare through enrichment as well. The evidence suggests that pain and suffering uh, can actually alter an animal's behaviour, physiology and immunology and that these changes can lead to variation in experimental results that impair both the reliability and the repeatability of animal studies. So it's important that we, uh, we pay attention to refinement. So just to talk about some benefits of applying uh, refinement in research, um, this paper from Trevor Poole in 1997, Happy Animals Make Good Science, um, really Trevor in, in the paper defines animal welfare as being how an animal is coping with the conditions in which it lives. So in, he says an animal is in a good state of welfare if, as indicated by scientific evidence, it is healthy, comfortable, well-nourished, safe, able to express innate behaviours, and is not suffering from unpleasant states such as pain, fear, or distress. Um, so indeed, as, as I've mentioned, ethics, law, um, reputation of uh, individuals and organisations, and public confidence are all benefits for applying refinement in research and the public um, support this approach. But if we, if we concentrate then on the uh, scientific um, side of that, really we can improve the quality, validity and reproducibility of our animal studies by uh, avoiding confound, confounding variables or factors which can be introduced by altered behaviour, physiology or immunology. Uh, to reduce the impact of confounding factors on translational relevance of the model and to improve the inter and intra-group variation uh, and therefore improve re re reproducibility. So on the right hand side of this slide we can see some, uh, some pictures from Dr Brianna Gaskell at Purdue um, and she has been doing a lot of work recently on the benefits of rat tickling which um, may sound uh, like a, an esoteric idea but actually uh, it's been shown through her research quantitatively that this does improve the welfare of animals. So it just shows that refinements can come in many shapes and sizes. So my last example is uh, I just wanted to talk to you briefly about refinement using home cage monitoring. So on this slide here we can see a system which was um, actually funded through our Crackit Open Innovation Scheme and is made by Actual Analytics, a, a company based in, in Scotland. And what we can see here is a standard uh, cage size rack um, on the right hand side. 
underneath that rack, uh, underneath that cage, sorry, is a, is a base plate, which is an RFID anten antenna receiver. Um, and this can pick up signals from an RFID chip, which is um, implanted subcutaneously in the animal. The other side of the uh, apparatus has a, a high definition video camera connected to a computer. So the uh, idea of this, of this project was to come up with something where we could use automated monitoring of behavioral outcomes to uh, help with phenotyping uh, animals. Uh, so for instance, genetically modified mice for safety pharmacology and for identifying signs of, of suffering earlier in group housed animals. So that's what this does, allows continu continuous monitoring in group housed rodents. It was funded through uh, Crackit, Open Innovation Scheme, um, and the real aims of this were to group house, uh, group house the animals, but actually be able to monitor individuals over a 24-hour period and automatically capture a range of behavior. So um, the, with a the combination of the RFID base plate and the infrared camera, uh, you can actually start to annotate video and, and use uh, harness machine learning to then identify those behaviors later on and automatically flag them up. So um, here, just underneath the picture of the apparatus is the paper that uh, was published from AstraZeneca and, um, and ourselves and actual analytics demonstrating the use of the system. Um, and we're actually going on with that further and we're doing validation to test the ability to uh, detect adverse drug related effects in proprietary compounds. And that's in collaboration with three pharmaceutical companies and a major CRO. Um, so the benefits of this kind of approach for um, refinement really are reduced handling of the animals, the automatic measurement gives very high fidelity data, and the data is also longitudinal. So you can often catch things you might miss, for instance, in the, in the dark cycle, um, or in the nighttime, or yeah, some things that you might not see with a snapshot. And just to demonstrate how this works in practice, we can see that the system here has um, identified this animal and with its RFID chip number and it can tell where it is in the uh, cage as well and in a couple of seconds this should switch over to show you that it can do it with multiple animals um, and really this has come on this this video is a good few years old now this come, has come on so that the behaviors which uh, the mice exhibit can be now be automatically annotated by the computer in many in many cases and it can look at social interaction it can look at how, um, how much the animal feeds or drinks climbs as you can see here um, and so it can uh, really start to start to give a very detailed picture of the behavior of a group of animals in their home cage without having to uh, touch them uh, remove them from that cage at all thank you very much i'm going to pass back to megan um, and thank you for listening thank you so much sam uh, now it's my pleasure to do, introduce Dr. Alex Wakefield. Uh, he received his veterinary degree from the Virginia, Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine, and he's a preclinical drug development professional with over 30 years of experience in both large pharma and CROs. He's managed large veterinary programs, has served as a scientific lead for pharmacology and GLP toxicology studies, and has been involved with marketing, sales, and business development activities. Uh, he started his research uh, career as a study director in toxicology, and he led a veterinary services group as part of Eli Lilly and Company for over 10 years. That included veterinary and scientific support of both pharmacology and toxicology studies for both human and veterinary drug development. I then had the pleasure of working with uh, Alex when he was the veterinary services group lead at Covance Laboratories, uh, which is a large CRO that's focused on early preclinical drug development. He's currently the Vice President of Veterinary Services and Pharmacology at Sinclair Research, and I'm really pleased to uh, introduce him today. So thank you, Alex. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Again, my name is Alex Wakefield. Great. So I, I really appreciate Megan and, and all the folks at Scientist.com for inviting me to give this talk. I, as, as, as you'll hear, again, I've been in the business quite a long time, and so putting together these slides was really uh, a great way as I sort of ease into the twilight of my career to kind of think back on all that's uh, happened, how refinement of animal work has evolved through my career. Um, and it's really been great fun to, to, to kind of pull back the stories and try to share them with you today. The one problem I have is that I have a lot of stories and we don't have a lot of time today. So I'm going to try to talk quickly and um, uh, get as many of these in because I think you, know, you just heard a great overview from Sam about refinement. These are terms that a lot of us are very familiar with. 
um, I want to try to, to, to turn that around a little bit and talk more about examples and, and some of the practical aspects of running an animal program, either as a, a welfare scientist or welfare veterinarian or as a scientist and um, making sure that we do the best work in the end. So yeah, my agenda is fairly simple. I'm gonna introduce myself a little bit, although Megan did a great job, so that'll speed me up there. I wanna talk about refinement in, in some general terms, then my definition, my, my functional definitions of refinement in my programs. Uh, I'll focus a little bit on enrichment as a, a subset of refinement. I do wanna spend some time talking about what I called in the past the dark side of refinement. Uh, nothing is all good and, and a lot of our best intentions can sometimes lead to bad outcomes and I think it's important to recognize those at the same time we're celebrating the, the, the effort to refine these studies and then wrap up with some final thoughts. So yeah, as, as Megan uh, chronicled for me, I've had a long career. It did start as a technician, which I think was important for me sort of being on the, the, the the front lines of, of animal work and uh, has, has become a basis for everything I've done since then. Uh, veterinary school, small animal practice. Started my career in research as a scientist, not as a clinical vet. Um, I was a study director in GLP Talk, uh, but then made my way to uh, Eli Lilly and Company and um, just through circumstances ended up taking over the clinical veterinary program there, um, supporting GLP Talks initially, but then my career evolved into supporting animal health program as well, and then into the, the Lilly Discovery program as well. So I've worked, worked across all phases and, and avenues of, of drug development. Um, when I was attending vet at Covance, in addition to veterinary roles, I again had a lot of scientific roles. For two years, I, I led the cancer um, pharmacology area as a lead scientist. Um, I eventually moved completely out of, of the clinical uh, work and was was a metabolic disease pharmacologist working with the non-human primates and then again I've made my, my way now to Sinclair. Most of my career has been focused in drug development um, and so a lot of my talk will be based on uh, uh, the challenges in drug development but I've worked with many university scientists. I think these ideas work across uh, all the animal sciences no matter where you, you may find yourself today. So it's interesting, Sam and I are trying not to, to, to mix or, 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 or give the same slides, but I thought it was interesting we both grabbed this definition. I, I, I uh, independently went out and found this uh, NC3R's uh, discussion. I love this. When they talk about the standard definition of refinement um, that we all know, minimizing animal suffering and improving welfare, but I really was attracted to this more contemporary definition, especially the last few lines where we talk about improving our understanding of the impact of welfare on scientific outcomes and it's it's really important to me and that's hopefully be a theme through my talk that we don't separate those two things because we're all about running successful studies this is not about running a veterinary clinic this is about running su successful scientific studies and so they have to be married and both goals have to be addressed so these are my working definitions of refinement, and I realize you know they're not 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 the classic ones as Sam discussed, and, and that that's a much better official definition. But for me, I think of these three categories: designing and running successful studies, treating pain and distress, and then enriching the animals' environment. And the, the non-traditional one here is design and run successful studies. I, I, I don't I don't often hear that discussed when you, when you're talking about the three R's, but for me. It, it, it is the most significant sort of moral and ethical dilemma I face every day. If, if I'm involved in a study that is not successful, then we have just wasted the animals that were used on that study. And that is the, again, most, most difficult situation I can ever find myself in. And so it's become a focus of my career is, is marrying um, welfare with uh, scientific success. And that's, that's, that's going to be best for the animals and, and medicine and, and science. Um, so I'll go through these, designing studies, treating pain, and enriching the animal's environment. So what do I mean by designing and running successful studies? And again, I think hopefully the folks on this call understand in um, drug development, you start with the pharmacology side or discovery phase where you're trying to, to find the efficacy of a new drug. You're, you're giving these, these medicines to animals that have clinical disease, and you're trying to see if you make them better. But then you have the toxicology um, side of the business, the safety phase where you're giving these drugs to 
um, normal healthy animals and trying to monitor them and find out if the drugs make a normal healthy animal sick. Um, you often see more ethical concerns with toxicology studies because we are driving to um, potential pain and distress. And so um, uh, some of the more complicated situations through my career I've been involved in have been related to tox. And so I have this example. And to run a successful tox study, whether you're a scientist or a veterinarian listening today, you need to understand what the FDA is looking for, because that's the ultimate um, goal of these studies is to be submitted to the FDA and get approval to move these drugs into clinical trials and then eventually to the market. So the FDA will say, so state that they need to know the maximum tolerated dose for a given duration of dosing, the targeted organs involved in any toxicity and the spectrum of events between what they would call the no observable adverse effect level and the maximum tolerated dose. Now that's a lot of words, and so what do they mean by that? And here's an example that came right out of an FDA presentation where they had a company who had a new potential new drug. They, did, they started with what we call a dose escalation study in dogs, where they were just walking doses up trying to find what possible toxicities were there with their compounds. They gave five milligrams per kilogram to a couple of dogs, nothing happened. They gave 50, nothing happened. They gave 150 mg per kg, nothing happened. So they jumped ahead and gave 2,000 milligrams per kilogram, just a whopping dose. And, and yes, those dogs got very ill, had to be euthanized. I think it was probably a, a distressful situation, but that was the, the initial data set they had. So from that, they ran a study where they had a control group and then three doses. Uh, 550 and 150 mg per kg. The study ran beautifully. No animal got sick. The, the high dose was what they called the no observable adverse effect level. They felt great about a drug that they thought appeared to be relatively safe. They submitted this to the FDA for their approval. Uh, usually after this study, they were uh, hoping to go directly into clinical trials and they were probably lining up patients already ready to, to dose people as soon as they got FDA approval. And so the answer they got back was perhaps unexpected, but they, the FDA came back with what they call clinical hold. If you're at all familiar with drug development, um, that is the one term you never ever want to hear. That's the FDA saying your program is not appropriate. You have to stop and you cannot give your drug to, to any people in clinical trials. And what the FDA was saying here was, you know, you've demonstrated that there is potential toxicity with your compound but then you didn't characterize that in any way. We didn't see what organs were involved, what was the spectrum, what, what makes animals a little bit sick and a little bit more sick, and then eventually to the, to, the, to the major toxicity. And without that information, they can't um, pick safe doses for people to um, be exposed to in clinical trials. And so this company likely felt like they ran a very refined study with animals that experienced no pain and distress, but in the end of the day, they uh, wasted those animals and did not have a successful study. So I'm gonna move on to treating pain and distress. And again, um, this is part of a talk I, I gave once on toxicology, but this applies across tox or other, other sciences. When I started my career, there was uh, this feeling that on, on studies, particularly tox studies, you should no, use no other, other um, pharmaceutical product because that could confuse the safety assessment of the test compound. And the truth is, you know, our, our business has evolved quite a bit. I think um, people have realized there's a lot of value to veterinary intervention and, and, and um, these treatments have significant potential to, to, to impact safety assessment, both for the better and the worse. Um, you know, quickly for the, on the better side, if you're a pathologist um, trying to look at ClinPath and tissues from a tox study and you're trying to find whether a compound um, has the risk of causing toxicity in people. And, and say an animal had um, developed a, a toenail infection, um, if you ask a pathologist, is it easier to, if I put that animal on an antibiotic and then you read those tissues, or is it easier just to let that infection go? They'll be more than comfortable with having an antibiotic on board, but they will be very nervous about having elevated white counts, elevated cytokines, inflammatory changes, maybe there's discomfort, the animal's not eating well, that'll create all kinds of confusion. Not treating that animal would, would, would muddy the data for the pathologist and make it harder for them to make a good assessment of whether that drug is toxic or not. 
On the other side of that, though, not to forget the worst, um, I think the one one situation I saw that was the one of the worst as far as treating animals was uh, there was a tox study when animals uh, one animal had a skin infection and the uh, the veterinarians were were struggling to control it with antibiotics. Um, so the idea was perhaps there was a fungal component to the skin infection, and so they put the animal on ketoconazole to treat for a fungal infection, which is certainly a fine thing to do in a veterinary hospital, but in a tox study, in this tox study, um, the ketoconazole competed with the metabolic pathway in the liver that was supposed to metabolize the test drug. So at a given dose, the animal could not metabolize the drug. The blood levels went very, very high, and the animal ended up having a seizure, a, a significant toxicity from a very high exposure to the drug, which should not have happened at the administered dose level. Now, scientifically, that could be explained, but that is not an easy uh, discussion to have with the FDA, it really complicated the development of that drug. And so just, just sort of good examples of the good and bad of veterinary treatment. So there are a lot of factors that go into when and how you should treat an animal on studies. Um, I think it's important to realize that treatment includes more than just medical therapy. Um, sometimes uh, yeah, other medicines are the ideal choice, but there are many other ways to alleviate pain and distress. It can be through early endpoints. It can be through increasing observation intervals. Um, instead of watching them twice a day, maybe looking at them four times a day. And that is a treatment and that you can take credit for that from both a regulatory standpoint and know that you are improving animal welfare by making those kind of changes. Dose selection, as I talked about, both before the study starts and even during the study, if doses have to be modified. It's important to, to know that the success or failure of veterinary treatments in an animal study can significantly impact clinical trial and um, clinical trial design and conduct. The, the, the ways veterinarians treat animals are very, very similar to how human doctors will treat people on clinical trials if these kind of toxicities are, are um, recognized. A great example is CNS compounds that can cause seizures. So Diazepam or Valium is a very common drug to treat seizures. If an animal seizes on a tox study and I as a vet go in and treat that animal and the animal recovers well, uh, clinicians, when they're designing clinical trials, will look at that. The FDA may also look at that and say, okay, yes, there's a risk of neurologic events in people, but clearly the standard treatments will alleviate that. So that decreases their fear of, of using those drugs in people. But on the other side of that, is if I'm in an animal study and I treat and the animal doesn't respond, that's going to, going to worry clinicians and the FDA because those are often their standard therapies. Um, very, very early in my career, I, I um, walked into a study that, of a glucose-lowering drug, and um, there were animals, there was an animal experiencing a hypoglycemic crisis, which in practice was a very common thing for me. So I treated it with glucose, the standard way, uh, I've treated many, many um, uh, insulin overdoses, and the animal didn't respond and had to be euthanized. And then a second animal did the same thing uh, a few days later, and I went to my management and said, there's a problem with this compound because standard therapy is not working. And I, I was new, and at first people were unsure, but eventually our clinicians who are gonna be running our clinical trials in the future came in, looked at the data and said, no, that veterinarian is correct. That's exactly how I would treat a person with hypoglycemia. And if it's not working in his study, it's not going to work in mine. And that's a major concern. Uh, treatment decisions. Uh, I always talk about with new vets that, that uh, come to work for me need to consider the stage of a compound development. Um, we talked about discovery studies, uh, DMPK studies, early talks, later talks. Um, I will look at the same clinical signs uh, in an animal and treat them differently based on the different study types that they're on because there's different endpoints that you're looking for in every study, different answers. And so there's different justification for um, allowing or not allowing an animal to experience clinical signs. And so it's very important to me that my veterinarians understand drug development and the phases of these different types of studies so that they make the best uh, outcome decisions.
The other point I always like to make with my vets is that every treatment decision must account for the animal, of course, but you have to look beyond the animal that's right in front of you. You need to think about the study and really think about all the animals that are eventually going to be part of drug development. So again, if you just think just about toxicology for new drug development, there, there's a series of studies laid out by the FDA that have to be a, uh, completed in, in most situations. If you look only at the large animal side of that, um, it's, it's not exactly this way every time, but often you're going to start with dose escalation studies, pilot studies, move into your GLP, one month study, three months, nine months. All these animals are eventually going to have to see this compound. So every decision you make on every one animal um, is going to impact all the animals that follow on after that study, and that's important to know. If I'm running a pilot study with, say, two animals at a high dose group, if they experience some toxicity and I try to jump in early and alleviate that or end that study and don't allow that to play out, then it's possible that when they when this drug moves into the one month study with more animals, we're going to have to go back to those high doses and end up giving those high doses to more animals in a more uh, formal study environment, which is less uh, responsive. Sometimes it, it's harder to be quick and, and respond to animals issues as easily when you're in these more formal studies that are so much larger. So seizures are a great example. If I'm running a pilot study with a CNS compound and there's a risk of seizures, I want to, I want the, to explore that when I've only got, say, two dogs, where if there is a seizure, I can immediately address it, treat them, euthanize them, and move forward. And from then on, all the studies that follow will go lower at lower doses and hopefully decrease that or eliminate that risk of any other animal experiencing a seizure. If I pull the trigger too soon and stop a pilot study before I've fully explored that toxicity, then they may have to risk seizures when you've got 24 dogs, 32 dogs, you could have six or eight animals all experiencing toxicity that you could have addressed early on. And so really need to look beyond the animal that's just uh, there in front of your face and think about the whole, the whole picture. So enrichment. Um, again, I think Sam did a great job. I, I don't need to go back to justify enrichment, the value of comfortable, happy animals. There's lots of ways um, to set up an animal welfare program where you are, but to understand that you, know, you, you, you need to be in an organization that has a core belief that animal welfare is important. You need to talk to every employee. You need to, every technician uh, that, that is working with these animals needs to be trained on pain and distress. They need to be comfortable and know how to communicate with the veterinarians. I always tell the technicians in my facilities that they are the eyes and ears of the vets. They are the eyes and ears of the animal care program. I can't put a vet in every room I have in my facilities, but I can put technicians in every room, and we're completely dependent on them uh, understanding what's normal, what's not normal, and bringing in um, help and support to, to, to make sure we're running these studies well. Um, uh, again, socialization group housing is, is probably the most significant evolution of refinement that I've seen across my career, and I'll talk more about that later. I'll talk more about enrichment, and then behavioral training is, I think, a little underrepresented when it's a great example of the tickling, which may strike us as funny, but um, acclimating people or acclimating animals to people, to our contact, to our procedures um, can go a, a long, long way and is sometimes not um, given as much attention as it deserves. So just a couple quick examples. These are some fun pictures. Some of these are old. I'm a little embarrassed about the rodent picture, but I'll explain that in a minute. But um, as was said earlier, enrichment is, 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 is hopefully designed to provide species-specific behavior, things that the animals really like. Um, I use that picture of the rodent just because it beautifully shows the nylabone. Rodents love to gnaw. Um, uh, I can put nylabones in dog cages and they'll last forever. I put a nylabone in a rat cage and it'll be completely eaten in a week. Um, I used to run through thousands and thousands of dollars of nylabones for my rodent programs. And it's just a great enrichment tool. Um, rabbits. Uh, I, I did a lot of work with uh, developmental tox studies. So these are rabbits that come in time pregnant. They have very short acclimation windows before they go immediately on to drug dosing. And so acclimation to environment, to the diet is a huge part of these studies. So uh, offering hay or hay cubes when they arrive um, is fun for the animals. It um, 
relaxes them, it improves their GI tract motility, greatly smooths acclimation, uh, better studies um, uh, based on, on uh, providing refinement and enrichment. Dogs, um, uh, just remember a great story. We all love to give dogs toys. Dogs play with toys and enjoy toys. And I once had a, a, some folks who really wanted to do a, a detailed study and they bought all these different dog types and their, their goal was to find the ideal toy that dogs like to play with. And they set up all these video cameras and they ran this thing for they ran hours and hours of video and then spent all this time combing through all this data. And at the end, their conclusion was when there was no person in the room, every dog um, was asleep. And then when a person walked in the room, the dog ran over and picked up any toy that was in their cage. Um, and that's not to say there are some better toys, but in our program uh, that taught us that a human contact was the most significant uh, thing we could bring to, uh, to our dog colony. And so geared our program around that. The top pictures are on non-human primates. Obviously they're the highest order species we use, um, require the most attention. Um, this just shows uh, uh, animals watching television, um, popping popcorn, and you see a monkey there filling his face with popcorn while he watches his movies. Uh, a lot of times I was asked, it's, it's, does TV really work? Do the animals really watch the television? Or is that, is that not good enrichment? And uh, early on, when we first started doing videos, I, was, uh, I brought in a bunch of kids programs because I was told that kids programs would be fun for the monkeys. And um, the technicians started coming up to me and saying, you know, the monkeys really hate the Teletubbies. <laughs> I said, what do you mean monkeys hate the Teletubbies? And they said, well, every time the Teletubbies would pop up out of the hole in the ground that they came out of, the monkey would go nut. The whole room would start screeching. And uh, we saw that same behavior when they watch nature programs with like chipmunks coming up out of the ground. So clearly the monkeys either wanted to eat a Teletubby or were worried about getting eaten by a Teletubby, but it clearly showed me that they interacted with that video. And so that was a worthwhile thing to do. Um, just briefly, the paint rollers are fun for grooming. We could spray a uh, very inexpensive paint roller with water, sprinkle crookie crumbs on it. The monkey could sit there and groom that, that paint roller and get a lot of pleasure and enjoyment out of that because that's, that's a behavior they were really looking to express. Uh, again, just quickly, rodents is a much, more, uh, much better picture of rodent housing and um, bedding, social housing, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, toys and treats and, and uh, uh, cage structures that can be um, part of enriching an enrollment, uh, a rodent's environment. Uh, tell a story about bedding bags. If um, there's a great product that was put out years ago, you could buy bedding in this little paper bag. And rather than using a complicated and dusty bedding dispense machine, you could just throw these bags in the cages. And when you put the rodents in there, they would rip it up themselves, create their own bedding, manipulate their own environment. It seemed like a great uh, program. Um, the problem we had is that uh, our program required that you observe every animal every day. Our husbandry people had, had, were required at least once a day to look and make sure those animals were healthy. Um, with those bedding bags, the rodents would, or the mice in particular, would bite a little hole in the bag and create a cave and they'd all go inside and be in this cave and you couldn't see them for a couple of days before they eventually tore all the way up. So we found the husbandry people would have to go in there the next day and they were shaking these bags like uh, kids looking for a toy in a cereal box and shake all these mice out so that they could observe the mice because our SOP said you had to observe them to make sure they're well. We eventually discovered that if the mice were healthy in one of these bags, they were, um, they were fine and any mice that was unhealthy or, or dead would be immediately kicked out by the other mice. And so an animal that was sick and needed attention was usually kicked out of the bedding bag uh, cave. And so we eventually would rewrite our, rewrote our SOP saying you had to observe the animal or if they're in a bedding bag, they were probably just fine. Large animals, same thing, you know, social housing has been a great boon uh, for most species. Uh, I think if, if anyone's tried to socially house rabbits in a lab environment, they might find that's pretty difficult, especially in pharmaceutical caging. It, it can be done in certain situations, but not easy in, in the work we do. EU standards, I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but many of you may know that the EU has very different standards for housing and space that animals um, are given. And th those things um, are, are fantastic and they work. 
um, but they really change how you interact with animals. And it's, 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 it's um, not come to the U.S. yet in full force, at least not been a regulatory requirement yet, but interesting to see where that will go into the future. Um, remote bleeding, I will mention briefly, that is, um, I had for many years worked with uh, this model with through Culex technology where we could do remote bleeding and eliminate a lot of the handling of non-human primates in particular. And that was pretty remarkable as far as seeing you know, what did stress an animal, what spiked their cortisol. And we really found um, it wasn't people walking in the room, it wasn't activity in the room, it wasn't noises. It was if you bring that animal out of the cage, as soon as you pull them through the door of that cage, that will spike uh, cortisol every time. So it was an interesting thing for us to understand about our animals. So again, briefly touch on the dark side of enrichment. There, there's there, there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, good and bad aspects of these things. Social housing is a complicated um, program that is uh, there's a lot there are obviously interpersonal stresses between the animals, uh, but then when you think about our data and our ability to collect data, like food consumption is complicated. Cage pan data I listed there. If you come in and there's um, there are clinical signs in the cage pen under, a, under a, a cage or a pen that has multiple animals. Who do you attribute that clinical sign to? And what incidents then do you attribute to that, to that clinical sign? I caution people about anthropomorphizing. These are not little people. Um, these are also not pets, like a pets at home. And so it's so easy to fall into uh, a belief system about what you think about animals and ourselves and apply that incorrectly to laboratory animals. An easy example is canned food. Uh, our dogs at home may love canned food, but a laboratory bred dog that's eaten nothing but dry food his whole life, first time you put canned food in front of him, he may be disgusted by that and refuse to put it in his mouth. And um, that, that can be worked through if you're just doing it for enrichment purposes, but I see scientists who need an animal, say, to eat a meal on day one of study before you dose. And so they just assume, well, we'll just put canned food down and everybody will gobble that up. That actually may not be effective unless you've um, acclimated the animals and, and helped them understand that that is a desirable, um, a desirable uh, thing. Uh, briefly, expense. Yeah, expense is a complicated issue. A lot of these things we wanna do cost a lot of money and can't we just can't spend all that money all the time. Um, but you just have to kind of pick your battles um, find ways to acknowledge things are expensive and um, figure out how um, it, these things bring value perhaps in other ways to a program. One story I'll tell about expense briefly is sort of a flip side of that. When I was years ago when we didn't social house and I wanted to bring social housing to our dog studies, um, people were very reluctant scientifically, worried about the impact of the data. They were not ready in the company I was in at the time to make this change. But I went ahead and worked out the program, figured out how it would how it could function. And then I waited. And then the day came when we were we had a special study we had to run that was unexpected. It would have taken two animal rooms. And I only had one room available. And so there was a great deal of uh, company stress about how are we going to get this study started. And then I stepped forward and said, well I have this plan to social house dogs so I could fit all the dogs you need into one room instead of two. And so yes, then they jumped on board because it it, it met a different sort of um, uh, financial need there. It was successful, and then management came to me and said, "Well, wait, you're you're talking about increasing the capacity of our facility by fifty uh, percent if we social house." And so then it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, accepted and, and brought forward. So um, yes, expense is an issue, but uh, don't let that daunt you and just. Uh, work with that, and, and you, you never know when you're, you're going to have these, these opportunities for success. One more example about where uh, this can get um, people into trouble. Um, this is back to social housing. So uh, I was involved in a study with a company where we ran a one-month tox study, um, and what we found was that our mid-dose of 100 mix per kg, that animals tolerated the dose very nicely, they would have some ataxia, probably were dizzy for a few hours, but then they'd recover and everything was fine. And this was back when we were single housing animals. Um, then this company uh, moved on to the three month study and they picked the 100 mix per kg as their top dose and set up this study at a contract lab. And this was running. I will say also at this time, a clinical trial was underway 
with doses in the clinical trial that were justified based off the one month study and that 100 mg per kg being a fairly safe dose. So two weeks into the three month study, um, we were uh, suddenly the dogs were in trouble. All the high dose dogs at 100 mg per kg were losing weight, looking anorexic. Um, the contract lab was very concerned and believing they were gonna have to bring the study down or bring the dose group down early. And the company I was with was very concerned because they, they didn't know why there was a difference in the studies and worried that they were gonna have to stop the clinical trials based on this new toxicity. So they brought this, this to me and said, could I figure out why there's a difference in these two studies? So I, took, I asked for the study protocol, read it, uh, immediately handed it back and said, yeah, I figured out what the problem is. And I said, did you read the husbandry section of your study protocol? And the scientists had not read the husbandry section. And I find that's very common and I would encourage all the scientists out there to not ignore those sections of the protocol. And what they didn't realize is that the contract lab was co-mingling the dogs. Co-mingling was a system of social housing where they, the dogs would run together at night but then in the morning, they'd come in, divide the dogs, dose each animal individually, do clinical signs. They could feed the animals when they're individually housed. And then they'd come back a few hours later, pull a divider. And when they pulled the divider, they'd pull the feeders to decrease the risk of animals fighting over any retained food. So what was happening was these animals had access to food, but they only had access for the three to four hours when they were dizzy and nauseous from the compound. So at night, when they were all recovered and ready to eat, there was no food available. And so they were all losing weight and that's why the study was, was, um, was falling apart. And so we just switched it over. We did cage pen food consumption. So we left the food in all night and we just did uh, food consumption for two dogs and divided it in half. And uh, they all gained their weight back and that study moved forward and everything was great. But um, it was just, uh, just an interesting intersection of, of uh, enrichment efforts, husbandry efforts, and then the study in just want to briefly touch on imaging and you know th this has uh, been great fun in my career I've had an opportunity to work with uh, a large imaging center lots of different technology that is uh, provides a great uh, refinement of the work we do it, it allows us to do longitudinal evaluations of one animal and so it can reduce the numbers of animals used in research um, dramatically it is again an expensive these are expensive technologies. They often require anesthesia. Many of these require some kind of surgery, but it allows some great refinement stories. And my favorite one is kind of uh, depicted a little bit here in the, in the lower square of pictures where fracture healing is a major medical need out there in the industry. And we're always looking for drugs that can improve uh, bone healing, especially for older patients. The, when I started my career, the classic study for fracture healing was to um, anesthetize a rodent and take a, a uniform weight at the uniform height and drop that weight on the animal's leg to create what they hoped was a uniform fracture. And then, then you could test drugs against healing that. Obviously, you can imagine that was a difficult study for the rodents. It was not very, um, uh, the, the animals, the, the fractures were not uniform. It was just difficult work. So with my imaging center and a number of folks, we developed uh, a model similar to, to what's depicted in these pictures where we could, I could take the surgeons, we could anesthetize animals, make a small incision over the tibia, um, tibial bone, drill a very precise hole into the bone um, that was very uniform in every animal. We cover these animals with analgesia, but they would be walking around the next day as if nothing happened to them. And then with imaging, we could follow these little defects that we had made, and you could get a beautiful picture of the healing of that defect. It was very uniform, very controlled, and you could easily tease apart a drug that had sped up that healing or slowed down that healing. Um, to me, that's the, the ultimate story around refinement. So we took a situation, we took a, a study that was difficult for the animals and made it less painful. We reduced the number of animals required to get the answer. In the end, we provided better data for the scientists to evaluate their compounds. Kind of the gold standard of, of refinement for me, and I, I've always loved that model. I just wanna end with a couple of thoughts. Uh, good animal research is a team activity. It's very complicated. No one of us has all the answers. I think the, the perfect team includes scientists, vets, pathologists, and the technicians that are in the rooms with the animals every day when you can get this kind of group together or a subset of this group, you really can make your best decision. Um, as scientists, remember to take credit that for all you do for animal welfare. Many people come to me with 
trying to write animal care and use protocols and they've described the pain and distress that animals may see. And then there's the question of what are you going to do to alleviate pain and distress? Um, how are you going to refine this study? And a lot of people say, well, I'm doing nothing. And, and the truth is they're doing lots of things and they don't realize that they've selected doses carefully based on, on information that preceded them. They are going to call a vet when they see clinical signs. They're going to observe the animals for, for clinical signs. They may treat or, or end early. There's all sorts of things that we do routinely these days that are all refinements and all need to be described there and get credit for everything that we do to make these studies as, as complete as possible. And then for everybody, scientists and vets, you need to be open to new ideas, push the boundaries. There's been so many changes over my 30 year career and there's so much more to do. There's so much we don't understand. And um, I'm very excited about where this will all go in the future and what you guys will do in science uh, tomorrow. All right, thank you. With that, I'll end. Thank you so much, Alex. That was fantastic. Uh, so I'd just like to remind you to keep submitting your questions. If you click in the little Q&A box at the bottom, you can go ahead and ask more. Uh, but we've got a few to start with. And the first is for Sam. Uh, Dr. Jackson, how can researchers participate in Crackit? That's a great question. So um, Crackit is the open innovation scheme that we set up at the NC3Rs essentially to uh, take technologies which may have been um, developed say in an academic lab and then give put behind that the impetus to push them over a three year period um, into a format where they can be then um, sold or marketed at that point or, or, or just prior to that point. So really the idea around this is to um, take innovative technologies and actually push them to a place where other people can buy them off the shelf um, and therefore impact um, animal uh, animal uh, three hours that way. Um, Crackit is a, uh, all of the information for Crackit actually is on, our, on, our, on the Crackit website and the NC three hours website. Um, it's an open innovation scheme as, as I said and it is uh, basically contract research um, so it's not like a typical grant. It is, um, it is uh, managed over in th three monthly periods for usually three years. Um, and the challenge is met um, by a consortium who are funded usually uh, for, to around a million pounds. So they're quite big challenges. Uh, if you want to get involved in them, they, uh, the, they are launched. Actually, they are on a website currently, the current open challenges. Um, and we will be launching new challenges in the new year. Um, so yeah, you can if, if, if all of the information about the challenges that we put out are in our newsletter, which can be signed up for from our website or indeed uh, on the website itself. Fantastic, thank you, Dr. Jackson. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Wakefield. Um, can you talk a little bit about the study implications of doing things like measuring food consumption over multiple animals uh, when you compare that, especially to uh, the need for clinical signs on an individual level? Yeah, you know, food consumption is one of the things that we've moved to social housing, that food consumption has become very complicated. And there's been a lot of debate about whether it's really a needed endpoint in toxicology. It's a historical endpoint, but is it really needed? Um, can you just do qualitative food consumption and follow body weight um, uh, instead? Or what many people are doing, again, as I described, doing more of a group food consumption, just dividing it by the number of animals. It, it does mean that it may not be exactly accurate animal per animal, but it does give you trends in groups, um, which is often all you need. At the end of the day, if you look at a tox report, it doesn't, it, 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 the, the conclusions that are drawn are more like this group dropped their food consumption, not as much this animal. And so it does still tell a story, but it's not as precise perhaps as we did before. Clinical signs as well. Yeah, that's, difficult. I mean, generally you can set it up so you, there is some time where you're observing animals individually. It, it is tricky when there's cage pan data and, um, you know, some, some programs just automatically attribute that to both animals and some arbitrarily attribute it to one. Um, uh, there's, there's pros and cons of both. And again, it gets back to incident tables at the end. Do you, do you really care which animal had it or do you care more about the incidents in the group? Um, being reported. And so, um, yeah, those are complicated issues that, that, that um, you have to deal with as you take on social housing. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Sam, the next question is for you. Um, with the rat tickling and other similar uh, programs to improve welfare, 
is it possible to show that they're positively impacting the animals and not just um, having less negative effects, uh, specifically with the cortisol levels, um, measuring those as kind of the absence of a negative impact? Is it possible to actually measure the positive impact? Um, yeah, that is that is a good question. And you're absolutely right. When, you, when you're looking at those kind of um, surrogate markers, they all, are always just that and they're, they're always a step away. Um, I think that so some of the work that um, from the Gaskell lab, which has been published recently, actually touches on this in terms of the rat tickling. And there are there are other examples as to how you can um, assess the uh, state of an animal um, without using a biomarker. And I, I think one of the one of the ways that we've promoted at the NC3Rs in the past is through uh, use of grimace scales. Um, so these are um, scales where you can look at the, the face of an animal, so a rat, a mouse, um, uh, uh, so on, so usually sm smaller animals, but although they have been developed for larger animals as well. And you can actually um, tell uh, how their welfare is by certain uh, signs from their, their facial features. And this has been taken a step further and actually automated um, through uh, using video um, capture. And uh, yeah, it's, it's turned, out, turned out to be quite an effective way of um, of being able to monitor an animal from, if you like, the outside. Very interesting, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one final question. Um, this one is for Dr. Wakefield. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how veterinarians learn about uh, drug development and those specific goals as far as scientific studies? Um, the understanding is that most veterinary programs are focused on um, actually veterinary practices with uh, companion animals or with large animals and not necessarily a pharma R&D standpoint. Yeah, I get this question, especially when I speak at veterinary uh, meetings about science. And, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to have sort of a non-traditional career. I didn't come up to the classic lab animal pathways. I came back and forth through science and vet medicine. And so it just afforded me these unique opportunities to learn the science side. And when I bring new vets into my program, if one of the first things I do, if I can, is actually assign them to be a study director onto some sort of program to allow them to be wear the scientific hat because it helps to see the different perspective. And then I think it's very important to um, that we attend each other's meetings, that we go to the tox meetings, we go to the pharmacology meetings, that we hear the challenge, the scientific challenges that these groups are facing. Um, if you can see, yeah, interactions with the FDA and see how the data that is being generated is being received because it, then you can translate that back into how an effective welfare program or veterinary program impacts the data and the quality of our work. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I think that was the last question. Um, a recording of this program will be available and we really appreciate your participation and uh, scientist.com appreciates the support and collaboration of the NC3Rs and of Sinclair Research. So with that, I'll wrap it up and thank you so much for joining us today.